Hey guys. So today's tutorial is on menus, but I also want it to be an exploration of how to go about planning any kind of data or complex system. So I often see questions about how to set out a quest system or a dialogue system, which as you can imagine, depending on the scope of your game, can require enormous collections of data. And it can be a little overwhelming to try and plan this. So really, these are questions about how to organize, store and access data. And I want today to be an illustration of how you can go about doing that. And we're just taking menus as an example. Now I find with systems like this, where there can be a surprising amount of variables and elements that need to be tracked and modified, I like to plan them out very carefully so that we can make the system as elegant as possible. And by that, I mean that we keep the code as simple and readable as possible, and we reuse code where we can, and also that we make the system flexible enough so that if we make tweaks to it later, or add in new elements, we don't break everything that we've done. So we want to go in as prepared as we can and consider all of the elements that we need and make the system with all of those in mind. So firstly, we're gonna have different menu pages, which each display a different set of options. So already we know that what we're displaying is going to depend on what menu page that we're on. The first one, as you can see, just has three options, resume settings and quit. Resume will play the game. Quit will obviously quit the game, but settings will take us to another page. So here we have audio difficulty graphics controls and back, which will take us back to the first page. So each of these will have their own page as well. And here, finally, we can actually get to changing the settings. So as you can see, we already have different types of elements. So we had resume and quit, which both execute a kind of function. And then we have page transfer elements that go to new pages. And finally here, we're starting to get to types of elements that will actually alter variables about our game. So that might be controls or the volume levels. And the way that we go about changing them is also going to be different. So right here in the audio, we have sliders. So you can see here, I can hit enter, start modifying it, and then hit enter again, and it will save the new value. And then in something like this, instead of a slider, now I have a kind of shift where I can go between a certain set of values. And then I'm going to have something like a toggle for when I want something to be either true or false. And also controls where whatever I input into the menu, it will change my control to that value. All right, so we have an idea of what our menu needs to have. Now we have to think about how we can actually store all of this information in our plan. And I generally find that using tables or grids is perfect for this. So what I'm going to do now is set up some grids for each of our menu pages. So firstly, let's just create the list of the menu pages that we had. So remember we had main settings, audio, difficulty, graphics, and controls. And you could have a bunch of others. That's totally fine. We're going to make it so that it's going to be easy to add new pages. All right. So now I'm going to create a grid for each of these pages so we can track all of the data we need on the separate menu pages. So let's start off with the main page. So remember we had three elements here, resume settings and quit. So in the first column, let's just put the name of what we're going to be displaying as a string. And then in the second column, let's say that we'll store information about what type of element it is or what that element does. So I'm going to create another table that has all of the different types of elements that we have. So actually let's start with the bottom four. Those were the easiest to grasp visually. So we had the sliders, the shifts, toggles, and inputs. And then we had the page transfers that go between the pages. And finally, I'm gonna call a more general one, just a script runner. And this is gonna be for things like resume and quit. And they're gonna be things that don't change anything visually about the menu. It doesn't change any inputs. It doesn't change what page we're on or anything. It's just gonna execute some kind of script. It's gonna perform an action. And that might literally just mean to toggle the pause variable, or it might be to call the end game, but it might also be more complicated. So if you're ending the game, you might also want to do a bunch of other stuff. You might want to save objects positions or play some kind of splash screen. So you would put whatever you want in the exit script in there and it will run that script. All right, so those are all of the different types that our elements can be. So for resume, resume is a script runner. Settings is a page transfer. It's going to go to a new page and exit is also a script runner. So that's their types. Now in the next column, let's store, well, we're going to store different things depending on what the element is. So for the script runners, let's store the script itself that we want it to run. And for the page transfers, we'll store the page that we want it to go to. 
All right, and then for the settings, we do exactly the same. So we had the elements audio, difficulty, graphics, and controls. They were all page transfer types. And then we put all of the pages that we want them to navigate to. All right, so next up is our audio. And we're gonna introduce a few additional sort of pieces of data that we need to store in this page. So now we have the elements called master, which is gonna be the master volume, the sound effects volume, the music, and the back page, of course. So the first three were of type slider, and the back one was just that page transfer. And now, because I wanna keep things as consistent as possible in this next column, for the sliders, I'm gonna store a script that's gonna be responsible for changing the volume. All right, and I'll just call that script change volume. So, so far it's kind of similar to the script runner type. All right, but we need some other things about the volume. So in the next column, I'm actually gonna store what the current volume is. So in Game Maker, the way volume works is that it's usually a value between zero and one. So we'll just have everything at one to start off with. And then in the final column, I'm gonna put what I just said, so the values that it can go between. Because of course, you might have sliders for other things as well. So just change this as you need. All right, so next up is difficulty. And this one's gonna be pretty similar to the audio page. So we're gonna have enemies, allies, and back. So I'm gonna change kind of the difficulty of our enemies and allies. So the enemies will be either harder or easier and our allies will be kind of less helpful to very helpful. And I'm really just putting this in to illustrate what you can do. Obviously changes to difficulty are gonna be very dependent to your game. So just take this as an idea. So these are gonna be a different type now, a different type of element. So they're gonna be the shift type where we're gonna change between a set number of values. So just like the volume, it's gonna execute the script change difficulty. And that's what's actually gonna be managing whatever alterations we need to change the difficulty. Next, we're gonna have the actual value that it is currently on. And then in the final column, we're gonna have, so those set values that it's possible to change between. So I've just put easy, medium, and hard, but in the actual preview I showed before, I had different settings. So you can put whatever you want here, be creative. And just note that the number in the previous column is actually gonna to correspond to kind of the entry number in the last column. So it's on zero right now, which means it's on easy for both of them. All right, so let's scroll down to the graphics and controls. So I had a few more elements for this. I had resolution and window mode. So that would be a shift and toggle. And so my resolution is gonna be a shift. It's gonna execute the script change resolution. It's currently on zero. So in the preview, I actually did have a bunch of resolutions showing up, but for the purposes of this tutorial, you can put whatever you want here. We'll go through the actual script probably in another tutorial because that will take a bit longer. So just put a bunch of numbers in here for now or strings, it doesn't really matter. So same as with the difficulty, the number in the fourth column is gonna correspond to the entry in the last column. Next, we've got the window mode toggle, which is just if it's full screen or not. So currently I am setting it to windowed. So that's the second entry. All right, and last one is the controls. So I'm just gonna have up, left, right, and down. You can have other ones as well. They are of type input. Now in the third column, so there's a bunch of ways that you could control how you're doing the controls themselves. I'm gonna use global variables to store what the control is in terms of the keyboard, but the global variable's name is gonna be what you see in these strings. So the global variable for the up input is just gonna be called key up for me. And then what it's currently set to is gonna be in the next column. So I currently have it as VK up. So that's the up button on your keyboard. You could put something like the W key, which would be ORD bracket, and then you would put whatever the letter is in those commas. All right, so that is our plan. So now we can actually see how we have gone about storing the data. And you're gonna find it's actually quite easy to translate this over to our code when we jump into Game Maker. So what I'm gonna do is kind of similar to this. I'm gonna be making data structures for each of the pages. They're gonna be grids, just as we see right here. So whenever we need to access any of these variables, we're just gonna access specific coordinates of the grid. So if you don't know, the way that DS grids work is they kind of have these coordinates like you see here. So this cell right here of the grid, to actually access this cell, we have to access a specific coordinate of the grid. So across here is the horizontal axis and down here is the Y axis of the grid. So to get, for example, this cell of the grid, the coordinates for X, Y would be zero, one. So that is the cell zero, one. This one over here 
would just be two, three. So we have done all of our planning. Let's jump into Game Maker. All right, so first up, we're going to create a new object. And I'm just going to call this menu. We're going to come over to its create event and do all of our setup in here. All right, so first off, I'm just going to declare a bunch of global variables. You might want to do this in some kind of controller object, but I'm just going to do it here. So I am setting up a pause variable that is basically going to be controlling whether I am showing the menu or not. So I'm going to hit a button to bring up the pause kind of menu. I'm also going to get the width and height of the camera just because what I'm doing when I'm drawing all of the elements is going to depend on what the camera size is. And then I'm just going to make a bunch of global variables for the different keys that I'm using. So you're going to want these to correspond to what you're using in your actual player object for the inputs. So whenever you do a keyboard check, instead of just directly putting in like VK left for going left, you would instead put global dot key left. All right. And the next thing I'm going to do is just change the size of the GUI. So the graphical user interface to match the size of the view. And this is basically just so that I don't have to worry about any scaling. It's just going to make whatever we do in the draw event be at the same size as anything in the draw GUI. All right. And now before we jump into the menus, I need a way of kind of setting up our menu pages and the element types for the menus. So if we just have a look again at our grids that we set up, you'll notice that for the element types, I kind of just put in a word, but what would that translate to in code? It would be a kind of variable name or something. So we probably don't want to use strings for this. So I'm actually going to create an enumerator. So the way an enumerator works is you can kind of define your own class of variables. So the menu page enumerator is kind of like a new class of variables. And within this enumerator, we're going to have so all of our page names. So main settings, audio, difficulty, graphics, and controls. And we just comma all of them like this. And each of these entries in the enumerator are kind of going to be equal to a certain number. And if you don't specify what the number is, so if you don't put main equals a number and you just comma them like we have, it's just going to make them equal to numbers in chronological order starting from zero. So main is going to be zero, settings is going to be one and so on. So if we wrote that, it would be equivalent. So now if we write menu underscore page dot main, that would be the same as if we had written zero. And you probably know if you've ever used arrays or grids or anything that knowing the size or length of the array is really useful for when you're looping through the entries in code. So one last thing I'm just going to put is height so that we can get the number of entries that are in our enumerator, because remember how it automatically assigns numbers to each of the entries. Height is just going to be the last entry. So if you want to add more entries, you would just put that before the height variable. And the reason I've done this, it was to keep our code readable. So I could have made our menu pages actual just numbers, number types, just like that. So they now correspond to kind of the entry number here, but this makes it a lot less readable for us. So using an enumerator means that we're still kind of working with numbers and we can still use this to access what page we're on as a sort of array in a list of entries. But now it's just a bit more readable. All right, so we're going to do the same thing for the types. I'm going to call this enumerator menu element type. All right, and now I'm going to set up actual grids for our menu pages, and they're all actually going to be represented by data structures. So we're going to start off with the main menu, and I'm just going to call this DS menu main. And now I'm going to create a script called create menu page. And we'll come back to it later, but just so that we have the scripts there. All right, so I'm going to use this script like this. And now I'm actually just going to input everything that we have here as an array. So each line is going to be its own array. So for our first line for the resume. So remember, we just had the string resume and now we put in what type of element it is. So for this, we're going to refer to our enumerator entry for this. So we put menu element type dot script runner. So now we have assigned that a type. Now we're going to put in the name of the script that we want it to run. So just like we had in the grid, I'm going to put resume game. So that script doesn't actually exist yet. So let's just make it so that we get it coming up properly. So resume game. 
And we might as well make all of the scripts that we had in our grid as well. So we had all of these as well. Yep, so now we have that coming up in the syntax. All right, and we're just going to keep filling out all of our entries exactly in this way. You're going to come up with these little warnings here saying that it wants more arguments, but that's just because we haven't set up this script yet. So let's keep going and just add all of those. I might speed up the video for this. All right, so this is what it should look like when you're done. You can see that it looks very similar to the grid that we had here. So we have all of the string names of the elements in the first columns, and then all of the types of elements in the second columns, and all of the corresponding arguments thereafter. So just take care that you have all of the brackets and commas in the right space, because the way that we've set this out is that each argument that we give the script is itself an array that we're declaring in these brackets. And then I've just separated them on different lines. And of course, be extra careful for when we have arrays within arrays like these. If I just come over here. So you can see I've changed it slightly from what we had in the grid just to be a little bit more fun. So instead of easy, medium and hard, I've just put some words and the same for the resolutions. And just note that the global variable names are actually in a string because we're going to use a function that will take in the global variable name as a string. So that will be whatever you put here. So for global.keyLeft, you put key left. All right, so now that we've done all that, we need to actually come into the create menu page script and set up the menus. So let's come over here, go into our create menu page, and we'll bring it up here. Now I'll add a description and also just the arguments. So remember they're of the form of an array and the number of entries in the array itself is actually gonna be optional. And of course we can actually have a variable number of inputs into this. It's just gonna be however many pages that you have in that menu page, right? So this is where what I was saying about flexibility comes in. We wanna make it so that whatever we put into this is gonna create a menu with that number of pages and elements with whatever data that we wanna input. So to do this, firstly, let's get the argument count. So the argument count is going to be how many pages are in that menu. So for the menu page, we have three lines, right? And these are all separate arguments. So there's going to be three elements in the main page. So in that case, argument count would be equal to three. All right, and next I am going to get all of those arguments, but we have to do it in a kind of sneaky way because we don't want to directly just say argument zero because then that would be a requirement for the script and we would come up with errors if we didn't input that number of arguments. I want to make it so that we can give however many. So I'm actually going to make a little loop and I'm actually going to set up a variable called arg and it's going to hold all of our arguments. And I'm also just going to have an i value that we're going to use to loop through all of our entries. And arg is going to be an array that stores all of the arguments we have. So however many arguments that we get in, this repeat loop is going to repeat that many times. It's going to store whatever argument that we're on. So it starts at zero. So for entry zero, it's going to store argument zero. And then it's going to increment this value for the next time. So now we have this array that has taken in all of these. So now we actually need to create our data structure, our grid. So we know that the height of the grid is going to be however many entries there are, so the argument count. But what about the width? Because we know that sometimes it's five, sometimes it's four, and sometimes it's three. So what you could do is kind of access them and then check whatever the longest one is and then make the grid whatever that length is. But to be honest, I'm just actually just going to make them all five just to make it a bit easier. Of course, that means that for those times we only need it to be three, we are just storing unnecessary empty cells, but that's not actually going to impact anything. So I'm not too fussed. So let's go ahead and create the grid. So I'm going to call this DS grid ID. I'm going to create the grid. And so we give it a width and height. So five, like I said before, and then the height was that argument count. So this function will not only create the grid, but it will also return the ID and it's going to store it here. 
And eventually we are going to want to return this value so that we can store it in here. So that DS menu main will equal the ID of the grid that we're creating. So at the very end, we're actually going to return this. But before we do that, we actually want to fill the grid with the values that we have input into this argument. So again, we're going to use a loop. We're going to use a repeat loop. You could use a for loop. I like using repeat loops. So I'm going to use my I value again. So I'm just going to reset that to zero. And now I'm going to repeat again by however many arguments that we've got. So what we want to do is basically go through the array, this thing right here, which corresponds to each row that we had here. And then I want to kind of fill these values one by one with the entries in the array, which means we actually have to do a, another loop within a loop because firstly we add this one and then we add this one and then this one. So we loop through the entries of the array. All right. So firstly, let's get the array that we're going to be working on, which is whatever kind of element that we're working on. So for example, the resume element or something, and then let's get the array length so that we know how many times to loop through this entry and fill the grid with however much data it needs. So for this, we have to be actually directly altering the DS grid itself. So remember how I said that to access a cell in the grid, we have to give it an X and Y coordinate. So we know that the Y coordinate is actually going to just be whatever our I count variable is, right? So if this is the first one, then we know we're on this entry of the grid and that's just going to be the first array. And if I is one, then that's going to be this one. So the thing that's going to actually be changing to slot in each of the values is going to be the X coordinate. So that's what we're actually going to be looping through and incrementing as we go through our repeat statement, which means we're going to need another variable X, X. And now let's do our repeat. The number of times we repeat is whatever the length of the array is. As I said, every time we finish a loop, we increment the X, X value, but during the loop, we're going to fill that cell with the appropriate value. So to do this, it's kind of like how you would go about setting up a coordinate, but we use just an accessor, which just means kind of get this cell of the grid. And then we give it an X and Y and the X and Y value is going to be whatever X, X is, and then whatever I is. And then we just set that to whatever entry that is in our array. And finally, at the very bottom of this repeat loop, we have done with that entry. So we increment our II value. So I know that's a little bit confusing. We are going with two kind of repeat statements, but it's a very efficient way for us to fill our grids. And that's actually it for the menus. So we have all of the information we need about the menus. So now if we come back to our menu object, it should no longer be complaining that we need a certain number of arguments because we made it that it can be variable. All right, so now we should be creating grids that are filled with these values. Now I'm going to do a couple more setting up things. We need some way of changing what menu page that we're on. So I'm actually going to have firstly a page variable. And then depending on what this equals, we're going to be on one of these pages. And then I'm going to have a variable called menu pages, which is going to be equal to an array that stores all of those. So let's just type all of them in. Right. So that is just getting all of these and putting it into an array. So now whatever page is equal to, we're going to access that page in the menu pages. So right now page is equal to zero. So it's going to be on the main page. And if we want to change to the audio page, then we're going to change page to be two because remember it's zero, one, two. And finally, just so that we can navigate the menu, I'm going to have what element that we're on. So I'm going to call this menu option, but I'm actually going to have this also be an array so that each page has its own menu option. So now depending on the number of menu pages that is, that's the number of entries that we're going to create in the menu options. So I'm going to do this with another repeat loop. So I'm going to go Right. And then whatever entry of menu option that is going to correspond to the page, I'm going to start that off as zero so that they all kind of start off at the top. 
All right, that is all the setup we need. And before we forget, so because we have created data structures, so those DS grids, so we have to come into the destroy or the cleanup event, and we have to destroy all of our data structures. And now because we have actually created an array that has stored all of the IDs of the data structure, we can just loop through this and delete them all in a similar way to what we've done here. So actually we can just grab this because it will be in a very similar form, but instead of creating you know, a new variable and setting its value, we instead are going to destroy all of our entries in the menu pages. All right, so we're actually done with the setup. Now we haven't drawn anything visually, but we can still check that all of our data structure setup has actually worked, that we've actually transferred our plan and arrays into grids. So if we run the game in debug mode, we can actually check on what our grids are storing. So either come up to this little bug symbol here or just hit F6 to run the game in debug mode. If there's nothing in your game, you'll just be met with a black screen, but that's fine. We wanna come over to this tab here, hit pause so that we can actually investigate some stuff. Come into the instances tab if you haven't got this already and have a look at your menu object. So we can see in here all of those variables that we set up for the menu. So our page variable, which was set to zero, and we have all of our data structures here with the DS prefix. And then the menu pages array itself that is also storing all of the data. And you'll probably note that interestingly, the IDs of all of our data structures are just numbers. That's just how GameMaker does it. But what you can do is, so it's just displaying the real value of it here, but if we right click this, and come and tell it that this is actually a DS grid. We can investigate this further. And now there's a little plus here and we can look at what's stored in each of the spots. So as you can see, our grid has a width of five and a height of three. So this was for our menu, our main menu. So that's exactly what we want. And now we can have a look at what is stored in each of our columns. So in the first column, right? That's where we want all of the strings. And we can see that that has transferred properly. And then in the second column, that was the type. So remember we had nice enumerators, but here it's just showing us the actual numbers. And you can see all of the variables have come across, right? And there was nothing actually stored in those fourth and fifth columns for the main menu. But for some of these other ones, if we just keep clicking and have a look at all their contents, you can verify if you have actually stored everything properly. All right, but next time we will actually visualize some of this data and get all of our options actually drawing onto our screen. So thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. So this topic on menus was actually chosen by a vote on Patreon. So thank you to everyone who voted and is supporting me to create these tutorials. And special shout outs to Daniel Hargrave, Max Molinaro, Uthelian, XD Game Studio, The Great Poultry, Stuart Wells, Monju72, and Hunter T for their support. Thanks guys, I hope you're well, and I'll see you next time.